We're in Helsinki, Finland at Nokia's headquarters and our newsmaker is the chairman of the board of directors at Nokia and that is Risto Silasma. Thank you for joining me, Risto. It's great to be with you. Now, Nokia is a very, very interesting company and brand. It's gone through many, many different uh, industries over the decades, the years, even the centuries, starting out as even a paper mill, producing rubber, tires, phones, you name it, Nokia's been there. PCs and TVs. The, is, the list is endless, isn't it? Um, I feel like it's part of my childhood. I, I grew up, my first phone was a Nokia handset. But how would you define the company today? What is Nokia today? Well, we create digital infrastructure. So basically, wherever in the world you are, if you make a phone call or you connect to the internet, it's very, very likely that the bits go through Nokia equipment or Nokia software somewhere along the way. And that's what we do. So the world really needs Nokia by the sounds of it. And when we talk about competitors and who uses your technology, competitors are not the likes of, say, Samsung and Apple, but more the companies out there that need the technology uh, to enable um, their devices, for example. Maybe you can give us an example of who the clients are. Well, the biggest clients are large operators, such as China Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, and so forth, but also large industrial groups, large logistics companies, large web-scale companies, such as Google and Amazon and Apple. So basically any company that needs to run very large and complicated networks. Now, over the last couple of years, Nokia has seen somewhat of a transformation. If I may be so honest, people I told about this interview, they were curious, Nokia still exists. That was sort of the raised eyebrows that I was met with. How do you respond to such a comment? Well, it's, it's actually a bit painful to hear those comments because Nokia did go through a very tough time with the onslaught of the Dutch phones by Apple and then Android. And we ended up in a situation where it was best for us to sell our handset business to Microsoft. But we also transformed the company at the same time and invested heavily into digital infrastructure. Acquired first NSN, Nokia Siemens Networks, which was half owned by us and then acquired Alcatel Lucent. So you could say that at the time of the sale of our handset business, we were a 7,000 person company, or just after that. Now we are a 100,000 person company. So quite a transformation. So Nokia essentially doesn't need the handset business uh, to thrive? Well, we benefit from the handset business. Nokia handsets are back. We have licensed our brand to a company called HMD that creates Nokia branded smartphones and mobile phones. And they are actually doing quite well. During their first year of operations, they ended up being number th three in the UK market, for example, for smartphones. And they are number one worldwide for cheap mobile phones. And what is it that makes them so popular? Is it the price? Well. The devices are good. They use the old Nokia design language. We partner with them on the design and quality. And of course, Nokia brand still resonates very strongly with people, as many of us remember fondly the days of using our first mobile phones, and they typically were Nokia devices. That's right, it sparks an emotion in us all, mm -hmm. almost. Um, so not a handset company, but still there is this sort of... Um, you know, view of Nokia as being a, a handset firm, but it's not completely removed from that given that you do have the licensing out there. Yes, and of course we have spent $50 billion in handset-related R&D over the years, which means that we own a lot of the IP in the world that relates to handsets. So basically any time you use the Apple App Store, you're actually using something that Nokia originally invented and Apple is paying Nokia for the license to use those inventions. So we are sort of participating in, in many parts where you don't see the Nokia logo, but we are still in there.
So talk me through uh, the 7,000 to 100,000 uh, jump in the last uh, months and years. How did that actually happen? And, and some say that you single-handedly made that happen. Well, in a large company, nobody does anything single-handedly. But of course we were disrupted. And I feel that any company makes mistakes. But good companies can react and recover. Nokia had lost that ability to react and recover. We made mistakes, that's natural. But the fact that we couldn't recover from that, that was our fault. I became chairman in 2012 at the time when we were had just partnered with Windows Phone, with Microsoft, sort of betting everything on that one card. Windows Phone would be successful. It turned out that it never was. And we ended up in a situation where we had to sell our handset business to Microsoft because we couldn't fund the negative cash flows related to that business anymore. But we used those funds to reinvent ourselves. We believed in the programmable world, which means that we can define rules that the natural world will follow. We get the data from IoT devices, from billions of sensors. We use logic to decide what needs to change in the world, and then that change is, is actionable. And in a time of crisis, when perhaps the brand uh, wasn't where it has been in previous years, how did you attract and uh, retain good talent, the talent you needed for the research and development of the infrastructure? Well, we have transformed ourselves through transactions by acquiring Nokia Siemens Networks first and then Alcatel Lucent and a number of other smaller acquisitions along the way. So basically, we have changed the, the cells in the body. There's ver there are very few cells left from the old Nokia. Actually, less than 1% of our employees carried a Nokia badge when I started, out of today's employees. So 99% of our employees are new Nokians. And therefore, we actually did not retain our old people. We sort of swapped the people out. And that's, of course, the only way to do a complete transformation in a very short period of time. Now, you say that at the time, it was a sort of one bet on that handset making a success, which it didn't. Uh, what are you betting on today that will be the success, the future of Nokia? Well, today we are not making any, any single bets that <clears throat> will either kill or save the company. That's, that's a very extraordinary situation. Today we believe in, in this vision of a programmable world, in IoT, in digital communications, in digitizing industries. Currently about 25% of the economic activity in the world is digitized and 75% is not. And as we move on to digitize that, to automate that, we can create huge productivity opportunities and GDP growth opportunities, and that's basically what we are doing. And when you talk of the Internet of Things, give me your wildest dream. Where do you believe that Nokia can enable uh, some of our future industry, be it in digital surgery or automation, driverless vehicles? Where do you see Nokia? Well, we do all of those, because all of those depend on reliable, low latency communications. If, if you are being remotely operated on, you really don't want the network to crash in the middle of the operation. And that, those types of requi requirements have never been seen before. But now with 5G, they are reality. And we are driving that transformation. I'll talk about 5G in just a moment. But are you saying, Risto, that without Nokia, then pretty much the world could not be plunged into darkness, but in terms of communications, it you could bring the world down? Well, we are not the only company in that position, but you are right that if you, somebody would suddenly remove all Nokia equipment from the world, we would basically go back to, to Stone Age for a few months at least. 
but there are other companies that are in a similar position. But there's no, no reason to worry. Nobody can remove all those pieces of equipment, you know, in a, in a moment. So things will continue well. Now, you mentioned 5G and Nokia has secured a loan from the EU, I believe, for approximately 500 million euros. Um, tell me about future plans with 5G. How, what is the potential? How far can it go? Well, these network generations are very long lived. We are still delivering a lot of 4G technology and we will continue to deliver 5G technology at least for the next 15 years. So that transformation will be gradual, but you will get new capabilities in various areas, especially for, for the corporate market. Can you give us an example of you know, a concrete, sort of tangible idea of the difference between 4G and 5G, where it could be of most use to a company? Well, industrial automation is the, the biggest example. Let's say you, you run a manufacturing plant and you want to completely automate that plant. You need different types of wireless communications than what you have been able to get before. And for that purpose, 5G is the answer. If you have a large windmill energy uh, company operating windmills in, in tens of square kilometers, you could completely automate everything in that using drones, using sensors in the, the windmills, but you need a reliable network and you need automation analytics layers on top of that network and that's what 5G and that's what Nokia delivers. And of course Nokia is not the only one here, it's also Ericsson, it's also Chinese firms. You're in the race against China in a way, are you confident that you can actually come up with the best infrastructure 5G ahead of China? Well, this is an industry that is based on standards because everybody's equipment has to be able to operate with everybody else's. So we are jointly driving those standard, standards forward. But there's still space for individual innovation. And I think we are very, very good at that. Our core for innovation is Bell Labs. And Bell Labs is known globally for the innovation that it has created. There's eight Nobel Prizes. It has what I like actually most. It has an Emmy, two Grammys and, a, and an Oscar. And we are one of the very few technology companies that can say that, hey, we have an Oscar. <laughs> Claim to fame. Yeah. Now, your neighbor um, and competitor Ericsson also has money to develop 5G. Does it not make sense to collaborate on this? Well, there are basically three large vendors in this space in the world. And honestly, there shouldn't be less than three. Because competition is good for innovation. And therefore it's not possible for us to combine with Ericsson. And what's your view on trade wars and protectionism? Of course we're seeing uh, China and the US, uh, also Europe involved in higher tariffs. How does that help or threaten the business here? Well overall I, I feel that the reason why we have been able to, to halve poverty in the world over the last 20 years. The reason why things are actually much better today than they have ever been before have been because we have been able to optimize the way we operate, specialize in different countries, by different companies, by different societies to do something that contributes to the whole world. And we have more people than ever before. If we would somehow go back 20 years in the way we run the world, we couldn't feed everybody anymore. The quality of living would collapse. So I'm a bit concerned that all these trade wars, they are throwing sand into the gears and we will all pay the price. So you're a supporter of globalism and supporting other nations? I don't think it's a question of being a supporter. It's just a que question of pure logic the way we run the world today and we feed all these seven billion people is based on a global way of cooperating and specializing and optimizing. 
And is that what mo motivates you in your role, Risto, that not only is Nokia a, a, an iconic brand and enabler in so many different ways across the world, but also it does play its hand in sustaining the world, in improving the world. Is that part of why you are here today and what motivates you? Well, absolutely. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I started my own company when I was 22. I took it public. I was the CEO for 18 years. I'm still the chairman of that company. And that's a technology company in cybersecurity. And I have always felt that I want to do something that has a positive impact on the world. And I wouldn't want to be involved with anything else. And that's what motivates with me with, with Nokia as well, because we do have a positive impact on the world. And we do some very, very difficult stuff. And do you believe that all brands internationally have a duty, a responsibility to the world? Well, I would hope that everybody would think that way. Unfortunately, not nearly everybody does. But somehow I feel that the younger generation thinks more like that. And it gives me hope for the world. You mentioned cybersecurity, one of your earlier ventures. Uh, how does that play a role in Nokia today because of course you mentioned that we would return to the stone ages you know if Nokia's lights were turned off the plug was pulled but what about hacking and cyber security generally is that a concern for Nokia? Well it's it should be a concern for everybody because as we just discussed we have become dependent on this sort of nervous digital nervous system that binds the world together if that would disappear all sorts of things would stop and you can attack this infrastructure using cyber weapons. Nokia is in a, in a good position here because we are a Finnish company. We are very rule oriented, norm oriented, reliable, trustworthy. We, we want to be that and we work very hard to be that. So nobody has suspicions that Finland would aspire to be a world superpower. It's, it's a ridiculous thought. So we have no need to, to spy on everybody as a country. But some out there could want to harm you. Do you spend a lot of money sure. protecting well, of yourself? Of course we do. And we spend a lot of money in making our own solutions secure. It's designed, security is designed into our products. It's a starting principle whenever we start to do, do anything. Now, in terms of the value of the company, talk to me through the financials briefly. Uh, over the last couple of years, you've had a lot of success in terms of valuation. Well, in, in terms of when we were, when I was just starting as chairman, the company's value was really low, market cap was really low. Our enterprise value went down to 1.5 billion and it grew more than 20x over the next four years since that. So from 2012 to 2016. So that was a tremendous growth of value for our shareholders. We have also paid very large dividends along these years and done share buybacks. So I think we have done pretty well for our shareholders. Now we are very excited about 5G starting because that's a huge new investment cycle for our industry. It's going to just start this year. Next year will still be sort of a starting year, but 2020 will be a bigger year. And then from there on, the investments will, will start to peak. And are you convinced that Nokia has now found its feet and its identity, given its history of so many diverse uh, goods and wares, uh, mapping also being a more recent one. Uh, are you convinced that you have the identity back and you're focusing on some core markets now, some key areas? I think our identity is, is one of a experimenter, a company that tries new things and a company that is able to change. So that is really our identity. But for now we are very focused on on building the digital infrastructures around the world and innovating around that. I want to speak about you personally for the last few minutes. Uh, you mentioned an interesting word, experimental, uh, also the ability to be agile. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, you have been, uh, over your history of 
your career. Uh, do you believe that you have um, an eye uh, for the future when you're looking at investing or starting a business? Do you have some sort of magic power that you can sort of see into the future and what will work and won't? Well, I definitely don't have any magic, but I work very hard to con continuously learn new things. For example, over the last 18 months, I spent a lot of time programming machine learning systems. So I went back to school, started programming again after a break of 30 years, just so that I, I truly understand how machine learning works, and then I can better understand what the requirements for both Nokia and my other companies are. So the magic pill, if anything, is just going back to school on a number of topics all the time. Don't delegate learning to others so that your people will give you a five-slide deck on machine learning and that's what you need to know about because you don't understand anything based on that. So never stop learning. And in terms of your more personal investments and, and startups, uh, at what point does a startup become perhaps a, a company that Nokia could acquire one day? Well, Nokia currently tracks about 1,200 different companies with the idea that they might become relevant for us, either as an acquisition target or as an investment opportunity or partner. And, and we continuously try to understand what is happening in the areas that we are interested in. Startups are there as well. We have a, a very powerful and successful internal venturing business. We have invested several billions of dollars over the, the years and we have been party to creating four new unicorns into the world through that venturing business. So we have various ways of, of keeping tabs on interesting companies, both small and large. And do you have any interesting vision for the future? Some say we'll be doing a lot of this because our phone will be everywhere around us, our smartphone. Uh, any sort of ideas of how people may be living in a well, decade from now? Well, I think the, the programmable world is kind of a, both a scary and a very interesting vision in the sense that think about if the world can be programmed. Then the question, who does the programming? And in what ways can we automate how the world works? Of course, it can optimize a lot of things. It can make a wor well, the world a lot safer both in terms of healthcare as well as, as traffic, as well as all sorts of other things. But there are some scary things there as well. So cybersecurity is important. New types of legislation is important. We need to very holistically think about the world that we are creating. In terms of uh, neighboring countries, uh, Switzerland being one of them not too far away, are there any lessons learned from other cultures, any countries you've obviously had businesses Nokia has in the future in the past sorry in Switzerland anything you could tell me about your impression of Switzerland well Switzerland of course is is sort of mentally very close to Finland we at least we Finns like to think that way I don't know about the, the Swiss people I'm sure it's mutual but we we like to think of, of Switzerland as a very safe country as a very high-tech country as a very well educated country a country that values learning and I think Finland is very similar. We also get snow and, and we like to ski and, and all sorts of other joint hobbies. But the special thing about Nokia is that we are one of the truly global companies. For example, our management team, we have eight different nationalities on our management team. And that, that is rare. We have operations in basically every single country in the world. We probably have employees from almost every single country in the world, in the company. And, and that is, is not common. And diversity is what creates success? Diversity is always a key part of innovation. But sort of cultural diversity is one, only one aspect of diversity. So I'd, I'd so much like to have more female engineers in the company, for example. And we are working very hard to... to excite young girls about technology. So playing the long game in that. Very good, Rhys. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.